As the questions come in, we'll try to go back to the answers from the questions from last time. We should have some time this, um, uh, this break before we go to lunch. A couple concepts that were touched upon are important to know in the self-care aspect also is your medications. You want to know your medicines that you're taking at home, and sometimes you want to tweak your medications with your doctor. There are certain pills like water pills that I would we recommend that they're tweaked on a basis that you feel good or bad. So there are certain things that you want to think about to discuss with your doctor about the medicines. The other cocktail of medicines that we typically prescribe when your heart function is weaker, um, those ones need some attention on the dosages, going up on the dosages to the goal that you want. So there are certain tools that you want to have for you to be able to contribute, not just for the healthy living part of it, but for the care part of it, which includes, do you know why you're taking the pills? Do you have a preserved ejection fraction or reduced ejection fraction, as Dr. Trackenberger pointed out? Those investments up front in knowing your heart failure will probably help you work with your physician on understanding why you're taking which pills. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to answer some of these questions from before. Um, I think we answered the question about depression post-surgery. The uh, eye drops for glaucoma now uh, depends on what kind. I think we probably would be able to look at it. Most of the eye drops for glaucoma should not have any major effects for the heart. So uh, it should be relatively safe, but if there's any specific kind that's different, again, if it's something new in ophthalmology, we don't know. So if, if they know the name, you should be able to check with your doctor. Are implanted with ICD, are you allowed to play sports such as hockey? That's a tough one. Probably not. I would probably say not. Um, we, we typically recommend not to play the contact sports and aggressive sports when your heart function is weaker, especially if you have a defibrillator. Um, and Aaron Barry, you have any comments? There's always exceptions. It depends on, on you know, if your heart's recovered, why you have it, certainly not competitively. Um, if you have a defibrillator, but uh, uh, so it, it it was something that would, you would should discuss with your doctor, but generally no would be the answer. Yeah, I'm sure the Olympic team will not accept at somebody with a defibrillator. There are some rules and regulations also they go by apart from safety. Um, and I think while, Barry, you have the, I think we can tackle the first question about the stem cell therapy. Dr. Trackenberg does research in stem cell. So what is the role yeah. of stem cell therapy? So I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you guys for an hour about the role of stem cell therapy in heart failure. But the short answer is there, um, it's been a, a mixed bag of studies, a lot of small studies, and several of them have shown a, a modest benefit. Um, right now, um, we are a part of a, a trial that's, that's you know, dozens of centers across the country are part of one of the largest trials of, of stem cell therapy and heart failure that will hopefully give us more answers. Um, but uh, there are some promising signals for stem cell therapy and heart failure. Not enough that we are doing them clinically outside of research for a known proven benefit, but it's a very... Uh, it's an interest, uh, an emerging area that uh, we're still learning more about. So hopefully there will be a role in the future. Then which symptoms or symptoms are the earliest clues that a heart failure is impending? Um, I think based on what all you have witnessed, it's very variable. And knowing about all of those symptoms are probably important. The most common symptom would be having a difficulty breathing. And more often than not, we see individuals with, who, especially if you're younger, you've got shortness of breath or you can't catch air as you're walking or you're tired. Either you get diagnosed with pneumonia or lung problems because it's, it's fair that you won't suspect that younger individuals will have congestive heart failure. Uh, but either fatigue, breathing difficulty, leg swellings, belly swellings, all these things are symptoms which could mean you could be having congestive heart failure, but also they could mean a lot of other things. 
So seeking appropriate attention and uh, making sure you just don't blame it on being out of shape or you know things which don't sound normal are not normal. And if you have any comments, Dr. Like I'd like to echo what you said about um, uh, younger individuals where this gets often missed in the context that common things being common, you know, bronchitis is common, uh, asthma is common, uh, but you know, probably uh, in our line of work, because we do see um, young individuals with heart failure and looking back with a patient, um, probably dating back to the initial event, which can be from days to weeks to months. So I do agree that I think it's important that you pay attention to your symptoms. Let's say you were diagnosed with bronchitis pneumonia, you were treated with antibiotics, you should feel better. And if you don't, to uh, talk with your doctor that you're not feeling better, and could this be something else? Because uh, 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 with younger individuals, heart failure, they, you, know, you can tolerate so much more of the burden of heart failure. Your body just compensates to a point you reach a point where you can, and it just tends to be a very sharp um, um, sort of drop in, in how you do. So I think just knowing your body and, and knowing uh, and working towards a, a full recovery, and if not, letting your doctor know, I think that's very important. And the, uh, the two questions about stents, typically stents don't have to be changed. Once you put in a stent in the arteries of the heart, they stay there, they're never taken out. Sometimes if that stent gets closed, we might have to put another stent within it, but the answer to that is the stents don't have to be changed. They're, they kind of get incorporated into the arteries of the heart. Um, there are newer stents that are coming out which actually get absorbed and and dissolve, and it's safe so that that struts and the metal doesn't stay, but they don't have to be changed. The question up here is uh, why kidney failure can cause heart failure. Um, that's actually a, 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 a good question in two realms. One is if you, you can have kidney failure secondary to heart failure, because the Apart from the heart struggling and you struggling, your organs struggle when the heart is weak. So it's very common, uh, especially if you have congestive heart failure between the cardiologist and the kidney doctor, you kind of get stuck shuffling between people because some of the water pills that we change can make the kidneys look worse. And then the kidney doctor is saying, oh, the kidneys are looking worse. Let's back off on it because we, we are all afraid of dialysis, which is appropriate. So when you have congestive heart failure, the kidneys get affected. The fact that the kidneys are getting affected is a sign that you probably should talk to the cardiologist about it and let the doctor talk. That's another thing. You see four doctors, we don't talk to each other, and you kind of get stuck bouncing between people. So that's one aspect of the kidney failure in when you have congestive heart failure. And sometimes I tell my patients where the lab work can look a little worse on the kidneys, but if that's what it takes for you to breathe better and have a better life, it's okay to do that because the kidney is not a kidney damaged by the medicines, but the kidneys look bad on, 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 the, on the blood work. If you have kidney problem per se, it depends on the reason. People who are on dialysis, the biggest reason when you're on dialysis, the individuals on dialysis die of heart problems. So the reason why you end up getting heart problems when you have kidney problems and on dialysis is because that creates high blood pressure, that creates inflammation. And when you have high kidney problems, if no one's telling you to check your blood pressure at home regularly and make sure it's controlled, you end up with heart failure. We see a lot of young individuals, especially um, African-American um, individuals who have a background of predisposition for high blood pressure, who end up with kidney failure, and they continue with high blood pressure, and by the time they come to us, the heart's gotten weaker. And, and a part of what uh, Mike was talking about self-care is knowing that you need to check your blood pressure at home. And blood pressure and diabetes are two things that if you don't take control and just take the pills and expect it to work, it's not going to work. And, and, and I'm sure my colleagues say the same thing. What I tell my patients is, I don't care how you treat your blood pressure. You want to do medica meditation, medication, or magic, as long as the blood pressure is controlled at a goal, I don't mind it. So if you take three pills and go home and not check your blood pressure, 
there's no guarantee that your blood pressure is at the goal it has to be at. So the kidney, patients with kidney problem, one of the biggest contributors for congestive heart failure is the fact that their blood pressure is not appropriately monitored. And to be honest, a part of it might be that, you know, we say, we, 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 as in following instructions, you were, you were given instructions to take medicines. If you were never given instructions to go home and check your blood pressure regularly and call me back that your blood pressure is not at goal, you, we, we can't say that you're at fault. But it's very common for us not to give that philosophy for you to take control because you, know, you have to give feedback and do that circle of loop. So the kidney problem is a classic example for it. The same philosophy actually holds with the fact if you have congestive heart failure, whether it is reduced heart function or normal heart function, the blood pressure becomes important and the goals vary. So you have to find out what is my goal, what should it be at home. I mean, if your spouse is making you mad and your blood pressure goes up once a day, that's okay. You can live with it. But if it's consistently high, then you have to do something to lower it, and most of the time it's medications. And I mean, this is, this is such an important point. I, I heard um, uh, the comment about um, keeping a log, and I think this is probably the best place where you keeping a daily log about your blood pressure reading, the time, and if it's out of range, even making a little note. Uh, was it morning? Was it after you walked around a block, after you got your mail? You know, when did this happen? Because yes, blood pressure fluctuates all the time, all the time, but what we're trying to look for is that with your medication and other, other therapies that, that for general, generally speaking, that is in the range where your doctor has prescribed you to be. But as Dr. Bermar said, unless you check it, it will never give you a clue. And uh, by the time it brings on the symptoms, such as headache, such as a florid, really quick uh, a heart failure, which can happen sometimes, um, you know, damage can be done. So this is eminently uh, uh, something that you can follow. I always tell people, invest in a good blood pressure cuff, uh, one that's reliable, fits on your arm, not on the wrist, and, and, uh, and write it down. And you know, this, is, this is just so important. And also, um, uh, with heart failure, with preserved ejection fraction, I believe uh, Dr. Trachtenberg has covered, and also with uh, pulmonary hypertension, those patients that have mainly the right side of the heart that is more uh, damaged than the left side of the heart, these, are, these patients are even more particularly vulnerable to uh, the kidney and heart interaction. So it, again, uh, you know, you'll find that uh, your, your heart failure doctor is paying a really close attention to your kidneys, and there's a reason. And if, you're, if your kidneys are doing well, and if they're happy, your chance of doing well with your medication and hopefully recovery is much, much greater than if your kidneys are not doing as well. And, and I think before we go back to the questions, I'd like to see if Dr. Agarwal wants to elaborate on the fact that I want to stress the importance that when she said cognitive impairment, cognition and memory is always associated with age. And I, I want her to comment on the fact that it, does it matter if you're younger or older when you have congestive heart failure, how does it affect your cognition and, and ability to follow instructions? Um, it, it is definitely much more common as we get older to have trouble with our thinking and our memory. But when people have um, issues with heart failure, sometimes uh, they will have some difficulties with their thinking and the way that they process decisions uh, at a younger age. Um, and I, it, it's actually still, it's not as common as it is in our older patients with, with heart disease, but it still is present in the younger patients with heart disease. Um, and it's, it's, sometimes it's not just memory, but it's that processing speed and that, that ability to try to make more complex decisions, more risk-benefit decisions and things like that, that, that are affected uh, more that are affected first when you have heart disease. And following instructions itself is not easy for human beings. And I think what is interesting is in that study, Dr. Agarwal shared with, they included, essentially, they took a pill box and then gave it to all, all the patients and asked them to fill it in and then saw how accurate that was. She showed the data for the patients, but they also picked medical residents who were training, who've passed med school, 
and there were about one percent of them who did it wrong. I mean, so they're expected to be smart people. So I think it's not about it, the ability to follow complex instructions as she alluded and blamed us for giving the medications is true. And that's another area of research. Poly pill, can we put all the pills into one pill so that you don't have to take 101 pills is an act of research. And you know, whether that's, it's been going on and, or can we eliminate all the pills and give you an injection. So these are all things people are working on, but with, you know, at this stage they're still limited and we get stuck with a big list of medicines that you're expected to take. It's almost, some of my patients joke about it saying, I have to have my pill breakfast after my regular breakfast because you're taking a lot of pills. Um, the other questions we have up here, I think the pharma pharmacology stent is the same thing like any stent, it, it doesn't have to be changed. And then heart failure and obesity, and Dr. Trachtenberg, you want to tackle that? And on top. It, uh, heart failure and obesity, it's a great question. There is an association between heart failure and obesity. Uh, it's a complicated one. One is that uh, th there are, there is data that in some cases obesity by itself can, can cause heart failure. Uh, and there's lots of studies on weight loss and bariatric surgery to, to curb that. Uh, and then the complicated part is if you have heart failure, and you, if you already have heart failure due to any cause, and you're obese, you might actually paradoxically live longer than someone who is not obese with heart failure. But the, the short answer is yes, obesity can cause heart failure. If you do have heart failure, we don't want you to be obese, but we don't want you to be frail and, and have too much weight loss due to poor appetite. And Dr. Ferrer, is melatonin okay as a sleep aid? In how to tackle insomnia. So my approach to insomnia is usually try to figure out what is causing the insomnia first and practice good sleep hygiene. That's always my first approach. So good sleep hygiene, including um, making sure that your the temperature in the room is okay, making sure you're abstaining from any caffeine or intense physical exercise right before going to bed. Um, maybe any um, interference with sleep, maybe noises, maybe incorporating the use of a uh, white noise machine. Is that phone. Oh, on the phone. Yes. There's a lot of sleep. Uh, sleep. No, I mean, this can interfere with your sleep. Oh, yes, yeah. that's right. And being on the can. phone, on the yeah. screens right before bed. <laughs> yes, the, the blue screen. So, so I'm very big on, um, on, um, on good sleep hygiene. Um, but melatonin, um, I have used a lot on my patients. Um, I, I think out of all of the ones that are available, that's the one I'm, I encourage the most. Yeah, I, I, I think medications-wise, other sleep aids are also not um, any deleterious for the heart. We, I personally also use a lot of trazodone for sleep. It's gentle uh, for the daytime. But as Dr. Ferrer pointed out, lack of sleep is important to recognize, but it's not just medicine because the medicine is not going to work if you don't go through the cycle of maintaining the sleep hygiene and avoiding things which disturbs. Yes, sir. Yes. I'd, I'd like to make just a few comments. I'm a gastroenterologist, and you seem to have left out one of the most important things that I've found in my practice dealing with patients that are having a problem with heart failure. And uh, the old adage, you know, that as people grow older, the things that they most concern themselves with are their, uh, their bank account and their bowels. <laughs> Constipation seems to, you know, uh, not have any preference of who they uh, it chooses to bother, but uh, in patients that I've seen with uh, chronic uh, heart failure problems, uh, I've found that they frequently see their gastroenterologist before they see their other doctors, you know, uh, because a lot of times they're affected by chest pains. Uh, some of them have reflux, gas uh, esophagitis. And they have to distinguish between the discomfort of that or they worry about, you know, the pain they, have, they might be having from their heart problems. Another thing, uh, if they're having stomach problems, say with their pylorus, 
the vagus nerve comes down, you know, the esophagus, wraps around, and it does have uh, a branch going to the uh, pyloric area. If they're having that and they go, uh, uh, there's an all, also a branch going into the heart, you know, from the vagus. And if they have, uh, say, a problem with arrhythmias and uh, they're having stomach trouble at the same time, the branch to the, uh, of the vagus to the heart uh, also innervating the area of the pylorus will cause uh, a, a, a difference in the arrhythmia that they're having too, maybe uh, going into atrial fib or something like that. Another thing, is, and the most problematic thing, is the uh, amount of diuretic that you're giving a patient to control the heart failure. Uh, this tends to dry out all of the tissues in the body and especially affects the amount of fluid that is used, you know, to uh, liquefy the stool as it passes. This is a real problem, constipation with these people like this. And I was wondering whether you do address that problem, you know, when you do see the they concern themselves, as I've seen, with the strain that they have to exert uh, to move their bowels. And uh, a lot of them take high dosages of uh, diuretics. Uh, the bowel is so dried out that uh, they can hardly move. <laughs> I'd like to know how you address that, because they can experience hemorrhoids from the strain they worry about the strain affecting the heart. They uh, concern themselves, you know, with bleeding. Um, and they go see their gastroenterologist. They don't go see you. They see their gastroenterologist. The, di the diet that you are going to talk about, I'm sure, is going to lose weight. have quite a bit of fiber. It's going to be reduced in amount. The fiber uh, content is going to be in, increased. And, it's, uh, and then the diuretic that you're putting them on, you know, is going to cause the problem of drying out all of that. So the strain goes through their mind when they experience a bowel movement. And uh, they come and see the gastroenterologist, not you. But they're worried about this. And it's a great concern. But the do dosage of, say, hydrochlorothiazide down. Uh, the lowest dosage, I, I think, is uh, 12.5 milligrams. And cut the dosage down to, say, maybe 6 or, or, or 2 milligrams. Using it on a daily basis. Because uh, I have patients come in and say they actually cut the hydrochloric acid capsules. And, you know, some of the medicine down the commode. But <laughs> I'd like for you to address that because I think the patient feels like you know that they don't they don't want to touch on the dust that you're getting but the problem is they're on no, I, I mean I, I think thank you very much. No, very valuable comments. I think you, you have an appropriate point, and I'm sure we can, we can address that because it is important. That the, the aspect you're bringing about is the kidneys, the lungs, the, the, the gastroenterologist. We're all specialists, but end of the day, it's one body. It's you, and, and everything affects everything, and we'll address specific about uh, no, GI yes. stuff. I mean, I think that the, um, how your gut is doing, it is so important to your health overall from a nutrition standpoint and how your food is getting absorbed um, to your overall sense of well-being, energy, and, and 
just micro and macro nutrition, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, gut behavior is something that needs to be a part of the, I think the list of things that needs to be paid attention to every day. Um, I do ask about uh, appetite, which, which is probably one of the earlier things that can go, early satiety, feeling full, feeling a little queasy after you have a meal, and the, the food that you used to love, just not tasting as good. I mean, all these things can be um, early signs of a heart failure. And, and along with bowel regimen, I mean, if you don't get a proper blood supply because of your heart being weak, uh, I mean, you know, you will get affected. So, and along with that, you're right, the diuretics, the vasodilators that can reduce your blood pressure, all of these things can indeed um, uh, affect how your gut moves and, and how your bowels are formed. Diuretics are a double-edged sword. As we all know, it affects the kidneys. It can do that in a good way or a bad way. It can affect other parts of your organ. I mean, I what we uh, uh, um, recommend and, and uh, promote is, like you said, a, a good diet, high in fiber on a regular basis, and to pay attention to your, um, uh, uh, your bowel movements and not get behind. I think that is really one of the key things. And, you know, if as you need it, um, you know, take a gentle laxative as you do so that, you know, you're not so behind where you need something really big to push you that you can keep on top of it. But it, it is a very, very essential uh, part of, I think, every, every day um, and in, in line with the sleep, uh, you know, your, your uh, blood pressure, and paying attention to your bowel movements. I think those are, ex you know, very, very essential items. And the various valuable points you touched upon. Um, we do have a percentage of individuals who end up seeing the gastroenterologist get a full workup and everything is negative and then they actually have heart failure because they go with symptoms which are more related to the right side of the heart. Your belly is full, your belly is bloated, you feel abnormal, your liver function looks bad on the blood test, uh, but end of the day these are all not the typical ways of presentation, especially if you are younger, we see that often that by, by the time you start feeling bad, you see all these other organs getting affected and you go through a full workup with a GI specialist until then somebody notices saying, I think the heart's the problem and then they come to us. So mm -hmm. it is important, early satiety, if your belly gets full and it gets soggy, you eat a little bit of food and you feel full. That's a sign of fluid buildup on, into your gut. With the context of what diuretics or the pills that take water out of your body, the water pills, it is very appropriate. We don't want you to take any more water pills than you need. But the question becomes how much you need. And that's where what I said is you have to learn your own body. And I have patients who say they're constipated because of the diuretic, they're feeling good, walking around, no leg swellings, no fluid buildup. We back off on the water pills. Water pills and the diuretics are one group of medications which do not change how the heart squeezes or do not change how people live longer. It's, as Dr. Park appropriately pointed out, it's kind of a double-edged sword and necessary evil because it does help keep the fluid out of the body when your pump, heart's not able to pump well because you're retaining fluid. So it makes people breathe better, stay out of the hospital. But if you don't need it, you can always cut it down. But then that's where, that's one pill where it can go up and down. Every day is not the same day. That's what we tell our patients. You, you're taking a set dose of water pills, but a week down the lane, you have a party and you eat a little bit of sodium and the water builds up, you might need to take an extra pill. Or you go out and work in the garden and you're getting dehydrated, or you have diarrhea and you're dehydrated, you might you want to cut back on it. So that's one pill you need to understand on how to play with, with the help of your doctors and with the help of your team. Uh, so that that's the class of medications need its own way of handling it and that's a big part of self-care for individuals. There are some technologies that are coming up in being able to measure the pressures in the heart so we don't have to overdo diuretics or underuse diuretics but diuretics become the common stay for you to have a better life where you can breathe better, and sometimes it becomes a necessary evil. If I cut back on the water pills and you build up with fluid and you can't breathe, but your bowels are moving okay, you, you have to pick your battles. And I let the, you know, you as an individual decide. 
So then we have to treat the constipation. So these are all consequences that happen, which as appropriately pointed out, sometimes it gets tough for the physicians and practitioners to talk to each other and, and then work as a team. And the team that we said was not just the cardiologist, but kidney doctors, liver doctors, everybody become a part of the team. And also, as the heart function improves, uh, you may need less of diuretics, which is what we always, you know, uh, uh, are hoping for. So I think I think knowing your symptoms and, and knowing your heart function and, and paying attention to that. If you feel like lightheaded, dizzy, and you know you, you don't you don't carry that uh, swelling that you used to, I mean, discuss with your doctor. Is there room to cut back? Can I try to do this? You know, weighing myself and and, and and keeping a log. I mean, I think those are really important discussions. Yeah, I think we're, we're, it's lunch break next, right? So we'll spend a few minutes just to finish up these questions so we don't have to come back to it. The next question was for Mrs. Kurtz on is there anything you wish someone had told you about living with heart failure when you were first diagnosed? And you don't have to be nice to us. You can be very <laughs> open and say we didn't do a good job. Um, well, the unique thing about my case is it manifested itself during pregnancy. So it was a lot of doom and gloom um, when I was first diagnosed, uh, five or six doctors told us we would have to terminate. Um, well, I had one just very blatantly say, you know you could die and you probably will. Um, so a little more optimism would have been nice if I could throw Dr. Trachtenberg under the bus real quick. I remember asking him if it was his wife um, what he would do, and he said he would ask her to terminate the pregnancy. Um, so yeah, just a little more optimism and, and less doom and gloom would have been nice. And, and I, I think that's, that's an important, important aspect that, that we maintain, because opinions are not verdicts. And, and when we throw percentages out, we, we try to when I say we, you know, it's not always universal. We learn by numbers and evidence and statistics. Um, and also the doom and gloom comes from the fact that we want to make sure, which, which the philosophy of medicine is making sure that you understand the risks because no one wants to, you know, be afraid of getting sued. That's unfortunate reality of, of practice of medicine. So everybody wants to tell you that this is a risk, this is a risk. So I, I want to make sure you understand. But Ms. Scourge brings up a very valid point. It's a balance of hope, of not all doom and gloom, and making sure that you understand that as much as we stress the realities, we want to take you back to the hope, unless it really becomes to a point where it is hopeless. I think it's a balance of being realistic versus giving hope. And I would probably say the healthcare system tries to be more realistic than try to be hopeful. And again, that's the intent of these forums and discussions that we want to acknowledge that nothing is perfect. And as Mrs. Kurtz appropriately did, you have to take charge of it, not skewed by one opinion or two opinion or three opinions, but make sure that you have done everything to go by what, what you want to take charge and make a decision. And, you know, and what we try to do is, is, is give you the, the armamentarium by giving you the information, which is where all the numbers and so forth come from. But it is, at the end, your decision. And with you knowing what the risks are. And I remember one of your slides saying, what is your happy? And it was very clear when I met Catherine that her happy were her babies. And that was above anything else. So, you know, as a team, you know, we try to our best to help you achieve that. And looking at those girls now, it's amazing, very amazing. Yeah, and it's the, when we do the per percentages, right, we say, oh, there's a 13% chance. I, I don't know what that means for an individual. There's a 30% chance. We're quoting some study somewhere, maybe in the East Coast. Texans are not like East Coast, right? We're all different, <laughs> you know? we're better. So when we, it's important for you to understand where medicine's coming from so that you ask the right questions. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by 50%? It just means that if I put 100 people in from what we've learned into a certain category and do something, we've seen that 50% of them go through this. Are you going to be in the 50% who don't do well or the 50% who's going to do well? No one knows. 
then if you tell us saying, I'll take my chance of a flip of a coin, then we are obligated to say, all right, let's do it together. And I think that's the part that we want to enforce that you understand that have the decision making sometimes is, is, is tough for all of you to understand what we're telling you about the chances and so it's a tough, compl complicated thing, and and as Mrs. Kurtz did, they were very tough and and you know understood what they're doing, and we're very happy that everything turned out well. And I think that's the part we struggle with when we treat a lot of patients. Sometimes we think we're right, and we turn out to be wrong. And if the wrong was a good outcome for individuals, then we're happy that we were wrong. But if the wrong was on the other side, then we struggle with questioning our own decision. As much as it looks like we know what we're doing, the reality of medicine is there's still a lot of gray area. There's a lot of gray area where you have to make decision based on, on, on things which are not that common, especially in congestive heart failure as we talked, that there are a lot of things that are unknown. So a couple of last questions are, how to, I'm guessing that's curb appetite. I yes, ma'am. The causes of heart failure that are considered idiopathic, okay, do you as doctors treat the heart failure the same as you would whether or not, let's see, later on find out that they have like Marfan syndrome or something? How important is it for these doctors to want to get down to the cause of these idiopathic, you know, Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I think it's a very appropriate question, and, and the question for others at the back, if you didn't hear, is when we say that a big chunk of individuals are labeled idiopathic, which means we have no idea what the heck it is. Um, how important is it for you to uh, be sh find out what the cause is? It is very important. So when somebody gets diagnosed with congestive heart failure, the way we look at it is the first thing, do you have blocked arteries? So, and if you're at risk for it, you do the heart catheterization, stress test, whatever it is. And if that's not the case, then you come back saying, all right, you're idiopathic. Because idiopathic is a mixed bag of things, there are some conditions which are treatable different than what we would do, for, to your point. For example, a condition called a sarcoidosis. It is considered still rare. It is still not diagnosed as much because we will have to do a biopsy. It is missed a lot of times. But if we see a suspicion for that, then we have to do everything in our power to make sure we find the diagnosis, because if we find the diagnosis, then we would treat it with different things like steroids and med medicines which suppress your immune system and not just go with the regimen for congestive heart failure. And even if you have certain disease, well, no matter what the cause of the, disease, of the heart failure is, the commonality is these medications that we prescribe. There's a list of medicines, the beta blockers, the AC inhibitors, the Coregs, the metoprolols that you might be taking. Those medicines have shown that they heal the heart. So the difference will be important to know that something else is causing it. Also, there are certain conditions which are again rare, like amyloidosis, in which none of these medications might work. And it's a completely different. So to your point, a lot of times you, and then other times, we, if we don't find these causes, we end up blaming it, oh, maybe it's a virus that you had, maybe, and we don't know. In the past, we used to do biopsies of the heart, where we used to go in with a catheter, it's not an open surgery, take a piece of the heart to look for it. But after a lot of studies, it was realized that it's not changing what we do because we're still not finding any reasons. So the common answer to your question is, you would want to find out what the answer is but there's a lot of opportunity there in the context of us, us as a medical community to, 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 do, to do research. And, and the problem becomes, say, if you have 50% of the people with idiopathic cardiomyopathy or heart failure, of which 5% have one disease, 5% have one disease. So no one 
gets money to do research in that 5% because it's only a small group of people and even if you do research, you won't find answers. So there are challenges in that regard, but you want to make sure that you rule out those other causes which will be treated additionally or differently than what we would treat every idiopathic cardiomyopathy.